Well, can you see my uh, my presentation? We can. Okay. Um, thank you once again for joining me today. I am Kimi Gomaina, an independent researcher based in Kenya, and I will be presenting to you my recent paper, Msani, a Fidelity Music Synthesis on a Houston Budget. Um, Sani well stands for uh, the artist. It's a Sahili word. So, why music synthesis? Well, music is a universal language. Uh, you can see how people from different cultures often listen to music from cultures other than the, the those of their own. And you can see that old and young people as well enjoy listening to music. And the rich and the poor enjoy good music. There's no one in this world that could tell you uh, good music is bad, whether they are rich or poor or young or old. Uh, music is something that is universal to us. Also, recently, we have seen a growing demand for high-quality music with the content creation platforms. We have TikTok with their funk type of music. We have YouTube Shorts, uh, which make music as well. We also have indie devs who are coming up with all these tools uh, that you have in AI that are enabling these people to make content easily. Uh, we need high quality music to go with this uh, so that you can see pixel level quality of animations with good music are uh, coming from small studios and indie devs. Also, uh, music synthesis is a long-standing challenge in machine learning and uh, it's one that you are quite uh, not dead tackle. So what's the hold up? Or why is music lagging behind if you compare it to other uh, domains such as text and recently image? Well, modeling audio is quite computationally ch challenging. Uh, imagine just a three minute uh, audio sequence has about 8 million samples, and that is just at CD quality. Now when you go to uh, studio quality and other high sample rate uh, audio re requirements, you get even more samples that are computationally challenging to model. Well, this high dimensionality of audio also makes it quite hard to learn wrong range structures both from a computational standpoint and also uh, from an efficiency standpoint so uh, because uh, we cannot work with music uh, at these uh, high sample rates. So what can we do about uh, this music? Well, for one, we can learn autoencoders that can reduce uh, the samples in music while keeping the quality where well, the probe is that we now have good quality music at low sample rates and we now reduce the synthesis uh, demands of our music and this is an approach that has gained a lot of traction recently. We have big companies, uh, people from Stability as well and Harmony are working on this. Uh, I know Zach is working on uh, audio synthesis with uh, uh, backed by an autoencoder. Well, uh, as many of you who have worked with autoencoders uh, will agree, making a good autoencoder is an untrivial task and it requires a lot of uh, computation to get it right and also a good uh, expertise to get it right. So, what else can we do? We can rely on alternative representations of audio, such as pain frequency representations. Uh, for one, we have male spectrograms. Well, the advantage is that we now enjoy reduced computational demands, and these pain frequency representations are well explored, and we have a lot of uh, prior knowledge to rely on if we choose to go this uh, path. And the downside is that the reconstruction now back into audio is quite uh, challenging. Since this is a low C representation, we often introduce 
artifacts that are quite disturbing and the music is not that pleasant to listen to uh, if we go with this option of using alternative representations. So um, in our case we choose to go with alternative representations because we have a lot of literature to back us up and we, it's the easiest to get uh, started with and we didn't, uh, frankly we didn't have a lot of uh, computation to explore other areas. So more about my spectrograms, these are a time frequency representation and we represent audio now in a 2D representation with frequency on the y-axis and time on the x-axis. We derive this from the STFT spectrogram and the reason for using my spectrograms is because they have features that are perceptually relevant to humans. For example, they encode a frequency in a scale that is closer to what a human would hear and how a human would distinguish two different frequencies. So uh, we now choose to go with the male spectrogram because we also have, uh, it's also a lower representation alternative uh, compared to working with the raw audio. Yeah. Well, the challenge again working with male spectrograms is that we are not modeling audio in uh, just a few seconds of audio. We have chosen to model a uh, long audio that is audio span in minutes and with a high sample rate of about uh, 44 uh, kilohertz. Well, the current approaches propose to treat male spectrograms as a 2D representation and you'll often hear that most people work with male spectrograms as an image. Well, uh, it's, it's, quite, uh, it's quite expected since uh, if you look at this male spectrogram, one might say it's, an, it's just an image. But now this introduces another challenge since the, terms, the term axis is often in the scale of tens of thousands and the frequency is in the, is in the scale of hundreds uh, for male spectrograms. Sometimes uh, if you go with the raw spectrogram, the STFT one, you, you get a, a frequency that is of about thousands of uh, samples. So again, we now have a large context to work with and this is again computationally challenging. Uh, just imagine uh, working with a unit trying to model a uh, male spectrogram of maybe 256 by 16,000. That would take forever and it would also require a lot of resources and maybe massive GPUs to work with both at the research level and also at the deployment level. So can we still work with male spectrograms and then uh, and also enjoy a uh, reduced uh, computation? So what we propose, and that is kind of the main focus of this paper, is that we treat male spectrograms as a tokenization scheme. So don't worry if this is not uh, clear at this time. So the male spectrogram, if I go back, it has a time and a frequency axis. So we can treat the time axis, we treat each time frame as a token on its own, and then we treat the frequency as the token dimension. Why we can do this, or what inspired this, uh, if you think about the STFT, we take a window, a window of the audio, and then apply, apply the Fourier transform in this window. So in a way, it's sort of a tokenization scheme that takes us a part of the audio and the Fourier transform is kind of a tokenization, uh, let me call it function. And well, if we treat normal spectrograms as a tokenization scheme with the term axis representing the tokens and the frequency axis as the token dimension, we can reduce the context size further down to just the time axis. So instead of 
having a context size of maybe 256 by 16,000, we only have a context size of maybe 16,000. So a short recap, we take the audio here that is maybe 8 million samples. This would be our context size if we wanted to work with raw audio. We reduce the context size by uh, applying the male transform. So we get maybe a context size here of, let's say, uh, if we go with what we worked with in the Msani paper, it would be 128 by 8,000. Then we again propose to treat the male spectrograms as a tokenization scheme. So each time frame has a token on its own. So that now reduces our context size down to 8,000. Uh, so that that's quite a quite a, a good step uh, downwards to reducing the computation. Yeah. So even though we have now about 8,000 or as we are working with currently 16,000 tokens, how do we efficiently synthesize 10,000 uh, tens of thousands of tokens? If you think about transformers, which are the main uh, kind of models for working with for working with sequ sequences or these tokens well they normally work with about uh, 512 or maybe for transformers from the big labs they work with about a uh, few thousand uh, sequen sequences a uh, context link that is so the Pros of working with a transformer is that they are well studied for working with tokenized, tokenized data, which is what you're proposing to work with in this case. They can capture long range dependencies because of the attention here. And well, we know how to scale them. And if we really wanted to make them larger and study how they function at these uh, huge services, we could do so by relying on the prior on the prior literature and research that has been done well uh, the downside to working with the transformers is that the scale dot product attention requires a quadratic memory well if we choose to work with 16,000 uh, tokens we would quickly run out of memory and also imagine now from the end user perspective telling them to um, maybe rent a server just to run uh, a music synthesis model that seems like a huge burden on them and so uh, we can propose to use the other alternatives of the attention well uh, mostly it has been found that these alternatives are not quite as robust and there are a lot of uh, tricks to, to work with them, though they do not perform as well as the original scaled product attention. Well, also even with these alternatives, uh, the computation is still quite high because uh, remember in a transformer, we usually keep the context size constant. So we'd have 16,000 tokens to work with at each layer. And I, Imagine for diffusion models, we normally have uh, very very large models with many layers, and thus we'd find that the training as well as the inference would take a lot of time and would also require a lot of memory uh, to run. So uh, we have another model that has been popularized recently by image synthesis uh, mostly by division models they have made uh, use of this uh, model that was borrowed from segmentation that is the unit the advantages of a unit is that we can now handle high dimensional data efficiently because they have these uh, down sampling and up sampling uh, layers and so we can now work with high dimensional data and a uh, reduced context size so we can at each stage we reduce our context size and because also units have uh, mostly work with cna convolutional uh, neural networks 
and they use uh, components as their main building block, we can efficiently uh, capture local dependencies. And with the increase in depth, we can also capture to some extent the global dependencies. So the downside to this, as I said, with some depth, we can capture the global dependencies is that we need more layers so that we can continue aggregating this information so that we can capture now the global dependencies. Also, we have not, uh, at least to the best of my knowledge, we have not yet explored how to reliably scale units. And as you're working with tokenized data, we haven't studied how we can work with units well on tokenized data. As I mentioned, they work uh, mostly with CNNs, which uh, the feature map is kind of spatial. And in our case, for tokens, the feature is usually uh, the most important thing or what carries the most information is that specific token. But for units, they have been specialized to work with this uh, data, this partial data. So what, what if we combine the strength of a transformer in the unit, maybe then we can get the uh, pros of the units that is working with high dimensional data and we can get the pros of a transformer that is capturing long range dependencies as well as the scalability and the ability to work with tokenized data. So that is what we proposed in Musani and this is just a high level overview of our unit. I will be going into depth uh, explaining each of the layers here. But as you can see, our basic building block here, the unit, our unit block, uh, consists of a residual block and a linear attention. is a form of attention that we chose to work with for reasons I'll be going into later. And our residual block is kind of borrowed now from the unit, and our linear attention is borrowed from the transformers. So here we can capture with the residual block, we can capture the local uh, dependencies, and with the linear attention, it can capture the uh, global dependencies. So, as you can see, the linear attention is is, uh, is indicated by this question mark. We will not apply the linear attention in all blocks. As uh, we we'll apply it in the very last blocks. Uh, kind of close to the bottleneck layer, that is where we apply the linear tension so that we can efficiently reduce the context size and uh, we do not uh, we do not use this linear tension in the upper layers because there most of the computation is mostly local. And so we also apply a downsampling layer to reduce the context size. The reason it's one by two, it's because in our unit, we support working uh, with multi-channel data. So we propose that instead of also downsampling the channel layers, this would make it uh, quite impossible to now adapt to data with more channels. We propose to only downsample along the time axis. So we keep the channel axis constant and we we uh, downsample along the time axis. Uh, a reason for this is that you can think of, you, find, you first pre-train this unit on maybe a large data set where you have like stereo audio and then you can fine tune it on maybe spatial audio or even audio stems without having to change the architecture. That was the main thinking and the main motivation behind uh, downsampling only on the time axis. Yeah. So a brief overview of the input and output layers. So we receive a, a male spectrogram, multi-channel male spectrogram with channels, frequency, and the time axis. And then we propose to treat the frequency axis as our feature dimension here. 
this is the part that now transforms the regular MELS spectrogram into a tokenized MELS spectrogram. And then we project it with a convolutional layer here and uh, out comes now the tokenized MELS spectrogram where our frequency behaves like the feature dimension, but our channel and time axis, those are handled differently. And the output layer just performs the inverse of this. Yeah. So now on to our residual block. As it is a division based model, we have our time step. These are the regular time step embedding that you're used to. I did not go into diffusion models because I'm, uh, I'm sure most of you have, are familiar with them. And so I do not want to make this talk uh, longer than it should be. Well, so now we have our time step embedding here. And we propose to use this grid uh, by grid convolution here so that we can kind of pass information along the, uh, remember the channels uh, would be what would be the height. Let's, let's assume we're working with an image. The channels would be what would be the height in an image and the time axis would be what would be the width if you're working in an image. So in order to pass the information along the channels, remember you're not done sampling them. So we propose to use a drag by drag convolution here. This is the one that also models the uh, local dependencies. And this here is just the residual connection. So because we are working now with <coughs> tokenized data, the main, the kind of the main that ignored uh, a contribution of tr transformers of this uh, MLP layer, because uh, remember that most of the computation in the transformers happens along the feature dimension. That is where most of the information is stored, and that is what you want to focus on. And so we propose to use an MLP as opposed to maybe stacking uh, multiple spatial convolutions. So we apply an, an linearity here, followed by this. Uh, MLP, it's a, it's similar to what you would find in transformers. Uh, maybe the only different thing is this nonlinearity here before the projection. But we project this now into a higher dimension, as you would find in transformers. Apply our nonlinearity and then back again now into our usual uh, dimension. Well. <coughs> The reason now we work with linear attention, uh, as I said, I would mention, is uh, well for computational reasons. Uh, though this uh, was not well explored, and I'm hoping I will be I will improve this in the coming uh, version of the paper. So uh, yeah, this is basically the attention that you are applying here, and everything else is just to our project, this uh, layer here just projects into the keys, queries, and values, and this here is just an output projection. Uh, there is uh, no much complexity here, and I won't build so much on that. So now, uh, let's see where we are. So we have explored uh, what happens, and we are now back here. Uh, to the uh, at this mel spectrogram so uh, as i said i won't go into diffusion models but the high level overview of our model is that it's a diffusion model the only difference say if you are to work with a gun you just remove this time step embedding here and now have the noise here and the clean mel spectrogram here but you work with diffusion and uh, yeah i won't go into details about diffusion models. Yeah. So now how do we get back to audio? Remember that after sampling from our diffusion models, we will now have a male spectrogram, but we need to go back to the audio waveform. We have two viable approaches. One, we can learn a neurovocoder, and two, 
you can use traditional vocoding techniques that maybe uh, it's just a simple matrix multiplication from the MEL spectrogram into the STFT, then using uh, phase reconstruction techniques. So we propose to have uh, to use a hybrid approach. This was, to, this was uh, done because we didn't have a lot of computation in the past, in the first version of the paper. And also, yeah, it was quite challenging to come up with a neurovocoder that works well. And so we proposed this simple uh, neurovocoder here. The uh, kind of <coughs> inspiration or the thing that drives this is that we notice that if you have a clean magnetic STFT spectrogram, even using the traditional phase reconstruction techniques, you can obtain good quality audio. And thus, uh, we do not see any need of learning a complicated neurovocoder. So basically, our neurovocoder projects the male spectrogram into the magnitude STFT spectrogram. It's basically just a projection. It, the only difference with the traditional neurovocoder you can think of is that this neurovocoder uh, re replaces kind of the matrix multiplication that you would have in the traditional one with a land one. That's the only difference there. Yeah. And so we now have this simple neurovocoder that we project now our magnitude STFT spectrogram back into the audio. So let's hear some audio. I don't know if it will play. Ah. So it will play. I don't think we're hearing anything on our end. Can you hear me? We can hear you, but I don't think uh, the uh, the YouTube uh, is playing. Ah, uh, you Maybe, can't hear the YouTube. But we can. Uh, let me find your links. We could. Uh, we could follow along on our own. Okay. Let's see, where are your YouTube links? <laughs> We're seeing these. Here's one link. And here are the others and they they match the pictures. So I just posted in the chat some YouTube links so that people can follow along on their own. Uh, that's nice. Okay. Um, so what we achieved with our approach is that we can now efficiently model uh, maybe up to three minutes of audio at high sample rates of about of 44 kilohertz. This is about 8 million samples. And if you go to uh, hugging face space, you can see this doesn't take that long. And our samples uh, usually remain coherent over time, though this could use some improvements. And we are able to synthesize diverse samples despite being trained on a small data set. We trained on the POP 99 data set, which is just 900 samples. And yeah, I was quite amazed that the model could generate uh, these diverse samples. And another advantage of our model is you can use it to now solve other audio tasks. As you will see in the demo, if you go to the demo page, you can solve tasks such as interpolation, audio to audio. I could not uh, manage to get in, paint, in painting and out painting working in time, but that will be fixed mm -hmm. in the upcoming version of the model. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, can hear ah, you. Good. 
Uh, okay. Okay, so what we'd like to focus on in the future is we'd like to uh, uh, integrate a conditioning mechanism into our model. Uh, maybe like what uh, Music LM has done and other acts that have come up, we'd like to do something similar. And we'd also like to go a step further and kind of borrow a leaf from what is happening in the image, in the image uh, side uh, to do something to do with uh, control net. You see how they use different conditioning mechanisms from other from other modalities that were not trained on. We'd like to test if our model can also handle such things. And we'd also like to improve the model components. This is by scaling up, by using better and more efficient layers uh, to work with, and by testing whether we could uh, optionally reduce the computational complexity of our model as well. We'd also like to expand on the range of generated music, testing on now real music uh, this piano music is synthesized from a uh, midi synthesizer fluid synth uh, well it doesn't capture the complexities that of uh, everyday music kind of uh, what you would need for production it's a simplistic take on music synthesis and we'd like to test whether our model can handle uh, this uh, varying music with many instruments, lyrics, and uh, yeah, just diverse music. Would like to test whether our model can work with such. So, in conclusion, we have now introduced Sunny, uh, this uh, novel diffusion based model. We show how we can generate long context music and high fidelity music efficiently. And this column is still under development and it shows great promise as a powerful tool uh, for music synthesis and like to continue working on this model. So I now invite questions. Right. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you very much. That was an excellent talk. Hugo, really yeah. appreciate it. Thank you. Who's got questions? We could either do